everyone. I'm Christoph Laputka, and this is Leviathan Presents. It's a segment where we highlight one audio fiction creator, have a conversation, and then play a full episode of their show right here in our feed. I hope you'll enjoy today's guest, and without further ado, let's get into the interview. This is Leviathan Presents. Hi, everyone. This is Robin with another episode of Leviathan Presents. And today I am joined by two people who I think are truly at the forefront of modern audio fiction, Travis Vengroff and K.A. Stats from Fool and Scholar Productions. Uh, if you're a fan of our show, there's a good chance you're already familiar with Fool and Scholar. And if not, you really ought to be. They've released a lot of great shows across all different genres, including The White Vault, Dark Dice, The Boar Knight, just to name a few. And they've won a whole slew of awards for their work. Way too many for me to list off each of them. We're going to be talking to them today about their latest series, The White Vault Goshawk. Travis and Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> uh, so let's just start by talking about how we got here. You guys started making audio fiction together seven or eight years ago, right? Uh, eight years ago. As a hobby. Yeah, yeah we wanted we to hang up together. started off as a hobby, like he said. Um, we wanted to create something. We've always been very creative. And we were living in England at the time, so we didn't have like our D&D &D group. So we couldn't be creative and play a game together. So we tried to find something that we could do instead. And uh, we started making a sci-fi podcast. Um, and what was it about audio specifically that drew you in? Do you have like a background in music or audio production? Or was it just that it seemed fun? Well, I guess it seemed fun. We listened to a few shows beforehand and we thought, wow, this seems doable. Um, we can literally be half the cast and no one will know if we just pitch our voices and act a little bit different. <laughs> I had a bit of an audio background, but I don't think that helped as much as one would think. I think it definitely helped. Uh, I think Travis not being intimidated by seeing a doll for the first time and instead having some experience, some interactivity, kind of knowing the ins and outs already was definitely a help because then we didn't feel like there were that many technical barriers between writing something and releasing something. We, we were highly intimidated though at the prospect of how do you upload it on the internet? Like that was this <laughs> giant question mark mystery. And having now managed an RSS feed for years, it's like, oh no, it's it's actually not hard. You just click the upload button and then type in your name of your show. The magic of the internet. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it's very forgiving. And eight years is quite a while. You mentioned that it started just as a hobby. So how has the process for you evolved in that time? The process to get from a hobby to perf professionals was arduous, but uh, totally worth it. Uh, many brain cells die. <laughs> and many new connections made. Uh, yes. But we've been working on it full time now for probably only, oh no, my brain just died. Only, air quotes, three years. Only four. Only four years. And a lot has changed. Just the, the pure numbers of people who have entered the fiction space between when we first released our sci-fi show, our very first hobby show, to now. So now we have so many different types of stories being told that previously it was a bit more of a slim pickings. And now it's just like a plethora. <laughs> people know what a podcast is when you yeah. talk to them now. <laughs> oh, I know all about that. We Yeah, we started even earlier yes. than you guys. And it was like... <laughs> Most people didn't know what it was. If they did, they thought it was just an NPR show. Yes. Yep. No, no, it's it's kind of like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty remarkable that you guys can do this full time now, especially for like a pretty small independent team. Uh, what was that transition like? Was there a moment when you were like, wait, we can make this work? It was less a moment and more like stair steps towards a goal. I was the first to go full time. Travis had a job that paid much better than my job at that time. So... Travis stayed in his kind of nine to five for a while, and then I became full time. The more that I became full time and was able to benefit from expending all of my time and resources on growing our podcasts, growing our reach, growing our audience, that kind of had a feedback effect, allowing more people to find our show, allowing us to get more for our advertisements and get more patrons. That allowed eventually for Travis to switch over to being full time as well. So it became a very much a feedback loop of now that one person is investing more time and energy, we can hopefully get to the point where the next person can do it as well. And you've alluded to it a little, but can you guys just explain what the uh, production process is, what each of your roles are in the shows? So I am the writer and creator of most of our IP. I write the scripts. I come up with the outlines. I write the scripts. We do a lot of the casting together. Uh, we will sit down and listen to a lot of voices. We'll cast out different people for different spots. Production is 
you, you skipped research. You do so much. Oh, research. I just assume, I, I consider that script writing. It's research and everything. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm like business admin guy. So if it involves talking with people and dealing with people, I'm the social one on the show. Uh, I've I've recently started directing, and I do a lot of the editing and sound design. And I co-do that with Dane Leonardson, who is brilliant, and I love working with Dane. A lot of the branding and marketing, uh, that will be stuff that I generally do. And then when it comes down to, like he said, being the face of something, it's most likely going to be Travis. We do work with Rel Media for our advertisements now, which has been wonderful. That allows us to, to take that little bit of the work off our, of our shoulders, uh, which has been quite nice recently. <laughs> Something I find really impressive is that you have done a bunch of very different shows, and I think a lot of people in fiction podcasting kind of get stuck on one show and have trouble breaking out of it. How did you manage not to fall into that sort of thing? Was it a conscious effort? We have a lot of ideas. I think Caitlin has a lot of ideas. Oh, and then you're they're all too. quite good. <laughs> and she's like, well, what if we did this? And I'm like, but we don't have an RSS for that, and we don't have a podcast like anything for that. I'd have to start from scratch. Yeah, well, that's not a problem. You can do that, right? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it comes down to being just overwhelmed with the want for creative freedom. I constantly push Travis to his limit when it comes to audio design. And then I go and I say, it's so wonderful that you've mastered creating an Arctic landscape with like roaring polar bears in the background. Now let's go to space and I'll put you on a space station and everybody speaks other languages. <laughs> and uh, you know what? He's very flexible and he's able to get it done. <laughs> yep. Is it difficult? Like, because you bounce between a lot of different genres. I, I know you do horror. You, you've got some high fantasy. You've got sci-fi. You've done children's stuff. Is it tough going back and forth so much? I don't think so. It's each one's like a different genre of music. And I think a versatile musician can play in multiple genres and still feel somewhat comfortable. And in that, what? Nothing. Continue. Oh, our dog is being silly. Okay. Uh, but we, we as a duo, Caitlin does a very good job of explaining the types of sounds that she wants out of the show because the sci-fi world can have a bunch of different types of beeps and boops if it's going to have those. It can sound very... Think of like Alien versus Star Trek. Like the Alien franchise has a very different look and feel and sound than like the Star Trek franchise does. And and yeah, like the differences between that are maybe an anime sci-fi. They're drastically different soundscapes. Once we establish what the brand is and what the sound is going to feel like, are we following one person? Like we're the POV, we're always this person. Is this a camera in a room of people that's moving around from place to place? Once these general rules are kind of established, it becomes a lot easier to go back to it because it's like, oh yeah, we're back in the white vault, core season, so it's going to be found footage. And like, oh yeah, it's fuzzy because they got some electrical interference or we're back in space with Nolira on vast horizon. So the POV is going to be Nolira's shoulder basically the entire time as she puts on helmets and crawls through ducks. I was not laughing at our dog. <laughs> oh. I was laughing at one of the only noticeable issues that I've had that you told me about when it came to writing two very different genres at the same time was when I was writing our children's show. Oh, yeah. And I had just come off of writing our horror show. And Travis was like, you cannot write this for children in this in this way. These are not words that are These appropriate. These are not appropriate. It's not like I, I said anything gory or explicit, but we have monsters in our world. And kind of explaining what it is that the monsters do to people, but not super gory. But he was like, you can't have somebody go to the hospital and never wake up. <laughs> like, yeah, so. He's better now. <laughs> <laughs> so there were that was probably the biggest issue with uh writing a script from two of the opposite sides of this genre spectrum. Pacing is also an important difference between our shows. Uh Dark Dice doesn't allow a lot of downtime between words because it bores people. In the White Vault, most of our new season for Goshawk is silence. And we're trying to not run the clock, you know, between words, but when you're walking in the woods with your friend and bored. You have to be comfortable with the silence. That's a great segue because we're actually going to be listening to the first episode of the White Vault Goshawk, which is part of the larger White Vault fictional universe that you created. Uh, you guys did five seasons, I think, of the White Vault previously, and you brought it to a pretty satisfying conclusion. So why don't you give a brief intro to the White Vault for anyone who's not already familiar and explain what made you want to return to it for another season. The White Vault is about good people who are well, generally good people who are intelligent individuals who are stuck in very terrible situations. Uh, it's about cults and luck 
and human sacrifice, a world of intrigue uh, that's to be uncovered. Our first five seasons are uncovered that way through found footage and a very particular perspective, which makes more sense the further you get in and is more interconnected than one might initially think. Uh, our newest story is a new viewpoint into the universe of the White Vault, where we are following some nature photographers uh, as some very interesting occurrences take place in the woods of Maine. Uh, and also something terrible on the other side of the world is befalling a seemingly normal mother. And why did you want to return to it? <laughs> Excuse me? Why do you want to return to the White Vault? You wrote this. I... So the first five seasons told one very particular story. It took place in 2010. And our modern season is telling the next big story in this world. And it takes place in the modern day. Modern day being 2023. I know it's now 2024, but uh, it takes place in the it's a period piece. Yeah. <laughs> the winter of 2023. And we got back to telling the story because we had, or I, I had, I always say we, sorry. Uh, I had the idea of where would this head next? And as we learned in the first five seasons, this is something that's been happening for such a long amount of time that the next important iteration in this world, the White Vault world, would have taken place many, many years later. So we have this brand new story in this new place with these other people. To clarify, we have some miniseries as we've explored other side stories and avenues of the White Vault and what those could be. But at our core, our interest is in telling new stories and not really rehashing the same ones in different settings. We, we took a whole extra year to produce, the, to, not to produce, to, to write it. I say we again, it's mostly Caitlin. She, she bounces ideas off me and I help a little bit. But uh, the, the general premise is this is a completely new story that its existence is self-justified and it's a story worth telling. And as the twists and turns are revealed, as they're already starting to be, as we're getting midway through the season now, uh, it's it's getting exciting to see people with their cork boards and red string on the internet trying to connect the dots that are being put down. Yeah, that kind of gets into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is I think with this season, you've done a really great job. I've listened to all the episodes that are currently available. You've done a great job of making it stand on its own and also be accessible to people who maybe haven't listened to all of the previous material. Was that something that you were like very conscious of when writing it? Absolutely. Um, it's strange because the way that audio fiction works, which you certainly know, is that in an audio fiction story, generally, if you're not an anthology, you're supposed to start at the beginning and work your way through. But most podcasts, so talk, talk show, talk show podcasts or comedy podcasts, you just download and listen to the newest one. And it's very much the opposite of what we do. So it was important from my standpoint that because Goshawk is a brand new story in this world, it has to stand on its own, but it is only sweetened and increased and bettered by knowing and having the background information from the other seasons, kind of allowing you to make your own assumptions very early on. And hopefully I can turn some of those assumptions on their heads uh, if I'm doing my job right. So... I very much want people to go in and feel excited about there being a new season and not feel overwhelmed if they haven't heard the rest, but also be excited to go back and listen to the first five seasons and even our mini series, if they so wish, because there is a lot more of the White Vault than what is in Goshawk and a lot more of the White Vault than what is in Svalbard. And it's also a great connecting point because the characters, um, most of them have no idea what what's happening. And it's we're, we're learning just alongside them uh, with the story because they have no idea about the other seasons or stories. So you mentioned before, and this is something that I found very striking, most of the previous seasons of The White Vault, I think all of them, relied a lot on like different sort of in-world framing devices, archival recordings, like journals, to like give a lot of exposition and sort of ground the listener. And you've moved away from that completely, as far as I can tell, in this season. Was that you wanted to differentiate this show? Was it a result of kind of feeling more confident in the craft now that you've been doing it for so long? Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when I first started writing The White Vault, it was only my second ever audio drama. And I saw the framing device of found footage as being something that allowed me to tell the story by using that idea of the unreliable narrator. 
and allowing me to create the artificial holes that I would need to lend this horror more of the mystery that it needed at the point. But as I just said earlier, the first five seasons were also a period piece. So by putting this story, the, the other story, the first story, one through five, uh, in found footage format, it allowed me to put it as a period piece back in 2010. And now we're back in the modern day and we're able to have an at real time story being told in Goshawk. If you also listen to the first five seasons, the last episode is the end of the found footage. And it very clearly bridges from this is found footage and it fades out of the found footage in a really dramatic way that I was very impressed with um, as, a, as a listener, as a, uh, as a reader, I should say. So. I, I'm happy that we are done with the found footage. It was a lot of fun to work with, but this is a new kind of story. He really enjoyed found footage because if somebody's audio was just a little bit too scratchy, he was like, that's fine. This tape is just a bit scratched. <laughs> I, we used so many cool things. There was like one session that was just absolutely terrible. And I was like, oh, they're on a Skype call. Let's just put some more like problems in it. <laughs> Something I think The White Vault has always done really well is immerse the listener with the sound design. Uh, your soundscapes are like active and really noisy in sort of the best way. It like adds to this sense of discomfort and horror and it also like really puts you in the environment. I think the current season does it maybe better than any of the others. Even in scenes where it's like just a couple people talking to each other, you're always bombarded with like the sound of like loud cold wind and crunching snow and all these like animal calls and fabric wrestling and you get these characters talking over radios where you have to struggle to hear them because they're so degraded. Can you talk about what goes into that both conceptually and then the execution of it? Caitlin writes a script. I usually look at something and just be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes in my script. So I will write um, the area, the environment into the scripts, the actions of the environment into the scripts. If I think there should be a bike going by that rings its bell, I'll write it in. If I think they are crunching on snow with heavy boots, I'll write it in. Transitioning to the wood exterior of a cabin. Yes. And I'll say heavy winds. Like I'll write these entire things. The Sometimes there will just be an open bracket, an entire paragraph explaining the audio cues for this section and then the close bracket. And that's where Travis just looks at it and goes, no. <laughs> I'll do it. it. It's just it takes a while. Um, so uh, for our sound design process, I directed the actors for the season of Goshawk. I send the edited audio over to Dane, who has the scripts and a lot of notes that I put in um, regarding like breath and how the breath is going to fit in and takes. He brings back a version of the episode that has all the sound effects and all the voices where they're supposed to be. And I'll get that. And then I will add Foley, change some of the timing a little bit to make certain parts a little bit longer or shorter, uh, add more intense versions of certain things, add more animals or passbys of birds. And then I'll bounce it back to him. And we will go through a couple of mixing passes. And because I'm a bit deaf and he's a very good mixing engineer. And I'm, it's like you're getting two sound designers at work in every single episode. Because it's not just us anymore. We're very, very lucky and thankful that Fool and Scholar Productions not only sustains us now, but we also have two full-time employees, which if Dane is one of them. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun. We get to do these like little virtual high fives. Like, okay, this is a really good thing. Can you add more bass to this? Like an extra thump, like maybe hitting some potatoes. Or I don't have potatoes. Do you, Dane, can you do that for me? Like, all right, I got you. I got you. Or um, he'll be like, I need, I need a scream here, a better scream. Do you have a better scream? Yes, I'll record a better scream in my basement because no one's going to like call the cops on us. We're okay. It's not Sunday. Uh, Travis, you had a very funny tweet the other day that I related to in a deep way where you said, stay tuned for my perfectly timed drinking of water, which was specifically performed in a way that won't disgust listeners. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yes, my perfectly timed drink of water. There's a scene in episode, I think, four, where just a girl says, can I have, a sip? Can I have some water? And the answer is yes. And I spent... 20 minutes getting the perfect sip of water because audience members, some of them really hate the sounds of eating and others hate the sounds of drinking and others hate the sounds of breathing. So you have to balance this with volume and EQ so that it doesn't feel disgusting when they hear that sip. And I had the actress actually drink water, but her sip was too gross. So I had to, I kept- <laughs> That's so mean. <laughs> but it's not a criticism of her drinking water. Like her breath at the end was great. Her reaction after the sip was very natural and her drinking the water was perfectly normal. But the sip itself was too intense for some listeners. Like, I would have to put an explicit warning on it. So I just 
I had to retake the perfect sip of water and then sneak it in and replace that one little part of the performance of her drinking the water. And we do a lot of things like this. Every time the characters are moving, they're breathing, and I have to drop the volume when they're breathing and bring it right back up every time they say anything important at all. Like, oh, and then they go back to breathing. <laughs> so it's these little moments that you experience that you don't always appreciate as a listener unless you are in it and you're editing all the time like you are, Robin. Like I, I <laughs> Yeah, I laughed out loud when I read that because in both Leviathan Chronicles and like my entire career in audio post-production, probably the most frequent note I've got is like, the food or the drinking sounds gross. Can you make it better? Yes. Uh, so... I know you've worked really hard to build a relationship with your listeners, create a sense of community for your fans. Uh, you've got a Patreon with a lot of bonus content people can listen to. And Travis, I know you do behind the scenes Twitch streams sometimes of yourself editing the episodes. What can people expect from you in the future if they want to subscribe? Uh, we have lots of new stories that we're always coming out with. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy the most is the bloopers that are always available because... I make a lot of mistakes, and so does everybody else in the best possible ways. Uh, <laughs> we, we're about to upload 21 minutes of bloopers. We also have a lot of behind-the-scenes uh, content when it comes to, like, we traveled to Svalbard, the place where the first season of The White Vault begins, and we were able to record a lot of audio there, take a lot of photos, and generally explain to our listenership and patrons what it was like to be in the location that had inspired our shows. And we always plan on having more mini series content in the future. Uh, we're currently in the issue, though, right now, where one of the ideas I had for a miniseries ended up being too long and has actually just become a full normal series. <laughs> and uh, coming out very soon in, in <laughs> April. Good problem so, to have. Yeah, good problem to have. But our Patreon is there because it is, as you would know, it is difficult to create content as a small team and get it out into the world and then be able to do things like that consistently. And we want to be able to tell our stories. We think that we're doing a pretty good job. We have entertained thousands and thousands of people across the world, and we want to keep doing that, and uh, patrons make that possible. We'll also have lots of really cool music up pretty soon. Travis loves music. <laughs> <laughs> For anyone that is interested in subscribing, it is, I believe, patreon.com slash Fool and Scholar. Yes. Just to end things off, what are your goals for 2024, the next year and beyond? Oh, no. Professional goals or personal goals? <laughs> it, could be, it could be either. Uh, per personal goals, we just moved into a house, so I want to kind of settle in. Uh, we One of the things that was posted recently was when we moved, because we now live in Germany, we used to live in the US. When we moved from one continent to the other, uh, everything we had got destroyed in a big crate. And so now that we're here and we have this house and we're buying new furniture and everything, my personal goal is to actually get it feeling like a real home. And uh, it's not just a home, it's also like our home base, because this is where we have our little studio space and our writing space, so. Uh, my goal is to get us under 60 hours a week each. Oh, that would be nice. That would be that would be very nice. But we said goals, not dreams. <laughs> <laughs> goals are attainable. Dreams are not. <laughs> yes. Everyone again, patreon.com slash fool and scholar. So Travis and Caitlin don't have to work over 60 hours a week. <laughs> we still will. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. And without further ado, let's listen to episode one of the White Vault Goshawk. Nothing. Got a few brown creepers singing over here. That's about it. You? Nothing. Except for snow laying down the back of my collar, I could have just taken a nap. I'm willing to give it another hour. How about you? Not really. Little creepers aside, I think we missed the window. There was just more out here yesterday. <clears throat> and I can't really feel my fingers anymore. Thinking I'll wrap up. My blind is developing a uniquely locker room-esque odor. <laughs> Not really any 
perfect shots this week. Not perfect, but good. Worth it. Not amazing, nothing phenomenal, but worth it. Yeah. I'm gonna call it. I got what I could. Okay. I'll pack it in. Bad luck, though. What was that? Bad luck. Having a slow last day out, it's bad luck for the next trip. Even a snowshoe hair would have been nice. Yeah. Birds don't tend to pay the bills. Owls. Owls can. People love owls. <laughs> yeah. Owls. You packing up yet? I will. I'm just checking on one or something in sight? plan on stopping by the blind tomorrow. Yeah, same. No worries. <laughs> the fuck is that? Look. Shit. Stop. Slow down. It may still be there. indentation caught up your links. Why is the shutter sound back on? I think it's long gone. The tracks are nice, though. Must have come around to take the food after we left this morning. It's a pity we missed it. And a pity about the food. Don't want it eating any of the plastic. Or thinking campsites mean an easy meal. We still have enough for tonight in the hike back. <laughs> Just be ready for a lot of peanut butter. <laughs> well, we still have the... The... Real 
footprints, human feet, without boots. Look, you and here it looks like they sat down, then they have boots on. <laughs> Fuck, my other pair of boots is missing. No way someone would be out here without... Well, damn. Toe and all. Is anything else missing? The boots, my extra jacket, some socks, I... I think the links passed through after the food was taken. And one of our thermal blankets is gone. A scarf, too. They didn't take everything, just stuff that... Stuff anyone would think was maybe extra supplies. My wallet's still in the pocket in the back of the tent, so it wasn't just theft for theft's sake. They must have really needed the supplies. No shoes out here? How? I wonder, I... A lost hunter, maybe? Or a hermit? Your spare boots are still here, though. Must have been a woman. Gotta be, yeah. You have small feet. You okay? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. They were expensive boots. I hadn't really broken them in yet, that's why I just had them along as my backup, but... <sighs> no, if they really had nothing out here, I would have given it to them. No, I meant... Are you okay knowing someone else was here? Sure. We were lucky we didn't encounter anyone during our photography sessions this time, but during summer shoots, there's always people out hiking or hunting. It's different in winter, though. Unexpected. Not a lot of people aiming to come out here. Yeah. Especially this far. Let's get cooking. Oh, the only choices we have left for dinner are some of these spicier ones. Mostly chilies and curries. You go ahead and pick. I'll set up the stove. And I want to pack before it gets too dark. It's already getting dark. Hurry and pick then. Time's up. Ah, okay. Three sisters stew or Thai curry? Three sisters. Ready to be uh, back in civilization? You mean no more spitting and cussing? <laughs> we do still have to hike back. You know what I mean. I look forward to getting the photos out onto the computer. I won't know what I got until then, not really. Sure. Same. <sighs> Tell me when it's ready, I'll start packing. You know, I think those slow-mo shots I got of the moose blowing snow off its snout is going to go over really well. Still hurts my heart to film in vertical. But, yeah. Or the steam coming off of them when the light's just right. I'll have to see if it really came out well once I'm back at my computer, but I also got a short burst of... Find something? Something else missing? Yeah, sure. No, Jean... One of these footsteps has, uh, blood. What? Shit. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be a day late. I have a long way over in Reykjavik. Oh, this! Hi, Sophia! Wait, wait. Thyralt of langt sidan vist samst sidas. Miklu betra. Your Icelandic is really improving. How is Gregor? Has he heard it yet? Oh, he's fine. Still on a trip in Vienna. He'll hear me when he gets back. <laughs> he always laughs a bit, but he won't learn Polish. He'll love it. You just have to take him to Poland to see your family again. Then he'll have to learn a little. 
or just toss him in the deep end. Yes, I plan on it. But like I tried to say, I have not seen you in days. Were you on a trip? Sick? Uh, two weeks, actually. Uh, I was in Greece with Jon and Artna. Jon is still working there for another two weeks. But we fit in a little holiday time together. Yeah, Greece sounds nice. Yeah, I could use a break from the cold. <laughs> you married an Icelandic man. <laughs> yes, yes, don't remind me. Mm. <laughs> Just you and Arna went to the Greece then? What about the others? Uh, they stayed home. Uh, and Arna flew over to Berlin to meet up with friends. Alone? Mm-hmm. Uh, she wants to go to the Pergamon Museum before it closes for renovations. Uh, this was the best time for it. You didn't go with her? Uh, Jon and I went years ago. And she is smart. She knows how to travel. <laughs> so now I'm back in the cold and have to go back to work. Mm, don't we all? <laughs> the usual. Uh, yes, please. Uh, and an oat muffin. Yeah, they're really good today. Good choice. Uh, total is 1,250 kronen. Take a seat. I'll bring it out when it's all ready. Uh, tak, Sofia. Berlin today as videos and reports revealed the terror of a vehicular attack on climate activists near the Brandenburg Gate. Eurovelt goes to our correspondent Bea Endrisi in Berlin for more. Bea. Here in Berlin at the site of the Brandenburg Gate, peaceful climate activists have been gathering for the past three days. Even in the cold weather, protests and songs have lasted well into the night. And as of this morning at 6 a.m., the crowd already numbered in the hundreds, with kind locals even serving coffee to those arriving in the early morning hours. Oh, you said Arnas in Berlin. But the peaceful protest quickly turned into a scene of tragedy and panic when at 6.43 a.m., three automobiles, including one delivery truck, were driven through the crowds. Shit. As of updates from local Berlin police minutes ago, 10 deaths have been reported. Over 50 people have been brought to local hospitals by emergency services so far with that number growing as uninjured protesters and bystanders work to bring the remaining injured to nearby medical facilities. Authorities are still waiting to report an accurate number of the total casualties, with several of those taken to hospital still in critical condition. Please. Police are asking that those looking for loved ones who attended the protests to please avoid driving to the Brandenburg Gate area. As all nearby roads are currently shut down. This way, on this Instagram story. Berlin police have arrested all three of the suspects who drove the vehicle to the Yes? Uh, hello? Can you hear me? I still think we should attract the footprints. No. Seriously, Iffy? It wasn't a lot of blood. Probably just cracked skin from their foot. Or a small cut. But going out there looking for someone at dusk? Look how dark it is tonight. We would have been out there in that. Stu is okay. Yeah, it was food. We should call Michael before it gets too late. Yeah. What if they're dangerous? The best weapon we have is bear spray. No, I, I know you're right, but... Like you said, I've got really small feet. Okay. So, whoever needed my boots and not yours also must have really small feet. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. But they didn't stick around to ask for help, which would have made the most sense if it was a lost hiker or something, so maybe they didn't even want our help. She didn't want our help. Again, just guessing because of the boots. The Lynx tracks weren't even going the same way. Please, try not to worry. Let's just focus on getting back for now. Did you pack everything else? Everything we don't need for tonight and tomorrow morning, but my camera's still charging gonna be a cold night. Already is. I'm gonna boil some water for his sleep back. Then I'll pack the cooking kit. Breakfast will be cold. <laughs> no coffee? <laughs> if you need it that bad, chew on it. <laughs> I'll get the sat phone.
Michael's still waiting for an update on our return. Hello. Hey, Michael, it's Effie. And Jean. Hey. Good to hear from you. How's the shoot been? Caught anything good? Hoping for some strong content for you both on this trip. What? Why? It's not like this was expensive. <laughs> if it was, we would have had better dinners. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's your choice to go to extremes. Not, not that I'm not appreciative. But really, I just mean that I expect great shots because it's your M.O. And I know you're both trying to fund the next trip. Anything I should be excited about? Uh, lots of moose, um, fox, owls, birds. Cute pictures of some rats, but I don't see people wanting to eat up some rat photography. Uh... Lots of video and bird shot content, too. Sounds good. We'll uh, make it work. I look forward to seeing it all. What's your timeline look like? <sighs> We're packing up tonight, and we'll start the hike back to Allagash in the morning. We're thinking it will take about four days at a reasonable pace to get back to town. Not rushing, though. That way, if we spot something worthwhile, we can still take time to snap some photos. We're still on schedule, so everything in the float plan we left you is still accurate. Uh-huh. Yeah, I have that right here. Um, yeah, four to five days planned to return to Allagash. But you're thinking four at this point? Maybe. Uh, what's the weather expected to be for Arstook these next few days? Wait, Arstook or Allagash? Uh, Arstook is the county, Allagash is the town. What's expected for Arstook? Give me a moment to open a tab. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, fuck. <sighs> fuck what, Michael? It looks like you've got some weather heading your way. Give me a minute. We were already talking tonight about how it felt a little colder. Yeah, I'd just be more worried about snowfall. Wind. Oh, yeah, wind. Still there, Michael? Just double-checking a few more things. Are we telling him about the missing stuff? Don't know why we wouldn't. All right, at the end, then. If you there. Nowhere else to be? I just wanted to double check so I could give you the most accurate information. Looks like you'll have a bit of bad weather passing through Arstook County. Most of it should be south of you, though. Can you read us the report? A uh, cold front pushing out across the main Canada Arstook border southeast. A high accumulation of snowfall expected in Arstook, northern in Somerset, Piscataquis, and Penobscot. Expect 20 to 50 centimeters of snowfall accumulation and wind speeds of up to 42 kilometers per hour, so like maybe 30 miles per hour. Temperatures expect to drop as low as negative 14 Celsius at night. Are you sure you're both prepared for this? That was terrible. Please just finish the report, Michael. Right. Uh, with daytime temperatures returning to negative 4 Celsius, this significant snowstorm warning will last until tomorrow evening at 9 p.m. Staying indoors is recommended. Check the availability of emergency supplies beforehand. Avoid exposure to the elements. Travel is not advised. That's it? That's it. We're prepared. We'd hope for better weather, but it's not unexpected. Northern Maine is finicky in winter. <laughs> Are you sure? I really wish you would have taken those snowmobiles instead of hiking in. You could have made it back in no time. We have the gear we need for this, Michael. It's not our first storm. And out here in the woods, we can find a place out of the wind if it gets too bad. <sighs> Might be able to catch some unbelievable videos, too. So you're going to be okay? Yes. Even without the snowmobiles? Yes. And again, the snowmobiles are very helpful, but some of our best photos never would have happened if we came in on those things. They're just too loud. And I love a good chilly hike. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit more than chilly, Jean. Well, good luck. Call me if you need anything. Can you be waiting in Allagash with some Irish hot chocolate? Not gonna happen. I'll see you when you get back to real civilization. Anything else? We had some stuff stolen from our campsite. Ah. Camera equipment? Cards? Thankfully, no. A pair of Iffy's boots, some food, and some small pieces of clothing and equipment. It wasn't an animal? There were footprints, so while we think an animal also passed through our camp, we're sure someone, probably a woman, took the stuff. Have you run into anyone? Nope. But there was a bit of blood, too? Just 
just a bit. Not much at all. Jeez, you sound like Monty Python. Okay, well, stay safe out there. And like I said, call me if anything happens. Oh, well, emergency services first, then me. Will do. Thanks, Michael. We'll see you in about a week. Break a leg. <sighs> He's going to be worried about us now. It's a concerning situation. Being worried is a normal response. I'm ready to turn those stew calories into a food coma, and since everything is packed well enough and the sun's already down, I'm going to sleep. You should charge your camera if you need to. Yeah. Are you staying out here? It's freezing. No, I just... You don't worry about her? Who? Oh, I do. But I also know she took some very functional things. She's somewhere in a very large, dark forest, and she didn't wait around for help. You and I just got off the call with Michael. You heard what he said about that storm. Let's just focus on us for now. We've done this a few times, but that doesn't mean we can get sloppy about it. That's how we'll end up hurt. Yeah, you're right. I know you're right. Sorry. You want to read? No, not gonna. Not gonna happen. Just going to sleep. I'll sleep and dream of a hot shower once we get to town. The showers at the hotel were lukewarm at best. Let a girl have her dreams. <laughs> mm. <sighs> did, did you hear that? Jane, w- wake up. What's up? Are we leaving? No, I heard something. Something's out there. What are you... Get your camera, your boots. Yeah, go. Don't forget your light, come on. Yeah, I know. Shit, it's snowing. Hurry. Let's go. Which way? Wait. This way. in the clearing. Uh, get, get down and set up. I forgot my socks. If we don't spot it, we'll head back. Look for tracks, links, or snowshoe hair. We've got tracks. Looks like links. Between that big rock and the one, two, third tree back. the one set. With that scream. Iffy. That was really close. Do you have the bear spray? I, 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 maybe, um... Uh, no, no, I, I don't leave it in my camera bag. Shit. But links don't attack people. Its prey is mostly small hares and birds and such. Yeah. It won't go after bigger creatures. Stand up. I still don't see anything. Snow will cover up the tracks soon. It's so close. This way. Snow's partially filled them in already. Moose! Hey, Moose. Just no minus. Just, uh, hunting for a lynx. Looking, looking for a lynx. No hunting. Just really thought you were a tree. 
so. Jean, back up. Port me. Yes. Did you see the size of that thing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> really? Yeah, did you see the size of that thing? Shutter sound back off. You know, I thought I did. I must not have saved the setting because it comes back on every time I turn it off and on again. Well, my heart's ready to go back to sleep after pole vaulting into my throat. You? Yeah. Ready to sleep. Wherever that Lynx is, we'd never find it out here in the dark. Nice try, though. You always wake up when noises happen. How do you not? It's a loud predator screaming in the middle of a dark winter forest. Most nights I'm honestly surprised my sense of self-preservation will let me get to sleep at all. Think any of the photos will be good? I set everything to the right settings while we were looking for the links, so I really think some of them will turn out great. I've never been that close to a bull moose before. I felt like a hobbit. <laughs> I think I got a few terrified shots of its feet. <laughs> few hours and we'll be heading back. <sighs> Sleep well. Mm. The pictures will be there in the morning, Iffy. Mm. I know. I, I just wanted to see it again. It all happened so fast. Just try to get to sleep soon. Like I said, it'll be an early morning. We'll leave when it's still dark. Yeah, yeah, I know. Go to sleep. Anything but your camera. Get up, look. I was there, Iffy. I saw the moose. God damn it, Jean, just shut up and look at the picture. What the? Where did you? It's from the background of the bird shots of the bull moose. They're in a few of the shots. What? Those are women, Jean. The White Vault, Goshawk, written and created by K.A. Stats, co-created, produced, and directed by Travis Fengroff, with script editing by W.K. Stats, associate producer Shion Francois, edited with sound design, music, and mixing by Dane Leonardson, and executive producers Carol Vengroff, Michael Villegas, Dennis Greenhill, and A.J. Punkin. Starring A.R. Olivieri, Lauren Tucker, Lena Makoff, Hilder Magnusdotter, Travis Vengroff, Felix Trench, Nicholas Grinier, and Paul Warren. For access to bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, and bonus seasons like Artifact, Imperial, Eluca, and Echoes, visit patreon.com slash foolandscholar and support this show and its creators. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening. Hey everyone, thanks so much for listening. All the links to the show you've just heard are in the show notes below. Definitely check them out and subscribe to their feeds if you like what you heard today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Leviathan Presents, and maybe you've discovered a new show that you'd like to binge. We're looking forward to bringing you some more amazing audio dramas to discover and letting you meet some of the phenomenally talented creators that are driving this renaissance in audio fiction today. 
Stay subscribed to this feed for more installments of Leviathan Presents, as well as all the full episodes of the Leviathan Chronicles, the Rapscallion Agency, the Invenios Expedition, and all the other spin-offs we have planned. This is Christoph signing off for now. Thanks again for listening. I'll be talking to you all real soon. Bye now.